All right. Ano ay kelohaya kako, pakahia pao, from wherever you are. Um, I want to mahalo everyone for tuning into this evening's event. This is a talk story event, and it's being sponsored by Kanayo Kana and Kaleo Unaopio, otherwise known as Kono. Now, as we continue to monitor the Kapu Kakiv uh, fuel tank situation, there are many concerns that is being brought up in regard to the protection of our natural resources. So for tonight, we did bring in an expert who has been at the forefront of this fight to protect our most valuable resource, which is water. And as we know, it's very important for us to protect these resources, not just for us, but for future generations. So with that same mentality, we also have the next generation of leaders who will be engaging with our expert on these issues. And at the end, after our expert gives a little presentation, they're gonna have an opportunity to ask some questions. Now, I'm also very, very excited to um, introduce a co-moderator with me. He is a senior at Kamehameha Schools, Kapa Lama, Joshua Chang, uh, I almost called you Joshua Chang. Joshua Ching, aloha kaua, pehea mai ne. Aloha, I'm doing good. Awesome, mahalo nui for, uh, for being with us and to all of our OPO panelists as well. Um, Josh, why don't you take it away and introduce to, for us our expert. Of course. Um, well, today we have Ernest Lau, who is the 10th Manager and Chief Engineer of the Board of Water Supply. As manager, Lau is responsible for the overall strategic direction and management of the Board of Water Supply, with a focus on furthering the department's mission to provide a safe, dependable, and affordable water supply now and into the future. Lau previously served as the Administrator of the Public Works Division under the State Department of Accounting and General Services, where he oversaw the planning, coordinating, directing, and controlling of a statewide program of engineering, architectural, and construction services. Lau previously worked as Deputy Director of the State Commission on Water Resource Management, Department of Land and Natural Resources, where he worked collaborative, collaboratively with the Commission members to set policies and make decisions in accordance with the State Water Code. Lau also served as the manager and chief engineer of the Kauai Department of Water from 1996 to 2003 and as deputy manager from 1995 to 1996. Prior to that position, he worked for the Board of Water Supply, City and County of Honolulu for more than 14 years as an engineer in long range planning and water systems planning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lau, for being able to join us today. The floor is yours. Well, mahalo everybody. and. Uh... That long list of jobs just means I'm really old. Uh, I guess you could call me uncle or I'm a kupuna now. And uh, it's so nice to be here tonight and to be able to see the next generation that will carry on the mission of protecting our vai. Uh, I, I do have a brief presentation if I could bring that up and share. Is that okay, Kumu? Okay, mahalo. All right, bear with me, everybody. Uh, Okay, here we go. Okay, everybody can see that? Okay. Good, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my daughters do technology much better than me, but I, I'll try to make it through this evening. Uh, just wanna talk here about uh, a little bit of background about the situation at Red Hill, uh, Kapu Kaki, uh, and the uh, condition of the aquifer that's been contaminated by the fuel that's leaked from the fuel storage facility there from the US Navy. Uh, you know, we learned from our kopuna, uh, vai vai means wealth. And, uh, you know, just uh, as things change, yet there are things that don't change that we have to learn from the past. We have to learn from how our kopuna manage our, our environment, our resources. Uh, and that's the tradition we try to carry on at the Board of Water Supply. Just some background for the Board of Water Supply water system. Uh, we serve about a million people every day on the island of Oahu uh, with drinking water. And that's about 145 million gallons a day being provided on average. Uh, and our infrastructure really is pretty extensive, uh, much bigger than the Navy's water system. Uh, but it, it really uh, starts with our sources, uh, feeds into these water tanks around the island. We have about 200 million gallons of water tank storage, goes through 2,100 miles of pipelines and serves 170,000, oh, sorry, my, oh, sorry about that, 170,000 customers uh, island-wide. 
uh, where our water comes from, this is a picture of what we call the, like the hydrologic cycle for Oahu. If you took a slice down the middle of the island and kind of looked at it from the sidewards, uh, you'd see uh, it would start with uh, evaporation over the ocean, uh, that water vapor precipitates in the clouds and falls on the, on the important watershed lands uh, that are Mauka and helps to recharge our underground aquifer. And we were very blessed on, in the middle of a very salty ocean, the Pacific Ocean, uh, we have an abundant supply of fresh water. And it's because of this, uh, what we call cap rock, which is the indicated in yellow around, it acts like a dam around the coastal areas. Uh, and that cap rock is less permeable, less uh, made up of marine sediments and deposits. Uh, so it helps to build up the freshwater body behind it. And over time, this uh, freshwater aquifer is built up over the island uh, where it is a hundreds of feet thick um, in the area of Kapukaki, uh, the elevation of the water table at the top of this aquifer, which uh, is about 18 or 19 feet. And when you think about it for every foot above sea level, uh, there's like 40 feet of freshwater below it. So it's almost like a iceberg that exists under our island in the porous lava rock. And that is the uh, fresh water that we, uh, we tap for our drinking water. Below it is salt water. Uh, and between the fresh and salt water is brackish water where they kind of mix between each other. So we're very blessed. And we take water from different sources that uh, we have, tunnels up in the Mauka areas uh, where we can tap the uh, dikes the water that's entrained at higher elevations and uh, water can flow out of these tunnels without electricity. Or we have inclined shafts that skim the water off the top of the water table like our halava shaft, which is presently closed. We have many deep wells that tap deeper into the aquifer and near the coastal areas, like especially in Honolulu, we uh, punch a hole, drill a hole through the cap rock into the aquifer below and water can flow freely uh, on its own under artesian pressure. Uh, the cap rock surrounds most of the island and this, uh, this graphic is shown in light blue here on the coastal areas, about 137 miles of cap rock uh, around our island. And these are the different aquifer areas or hydrologic units in, in the Honolulu, uh, in the aquifers for Oahu. Um, the Commission on Water Resources Management uh, has regulatory authority under the state water code for most of the island of Oahu controlling how much we can pump out of these aquifers. And they've created a map like this, which delineates different hydrologic, sec uh, hydro uh, hydrologic sectors of the aquifer that uh, they can determine how much can be pumped uh, and can be sustained without uh, detrimental effects on the aquifer. For example, like the Wapahu Waiava aquifer, you can see the term 100, 105 MGD. Uh, what that says is, out of that area of the aquifer, you can pump 105 million gallons a day sustainably uh, without uh, having detrimental effects to the aquifer, in particular making the, uh, the fresh water more salty because of over pumping and pulling in salt water from below or from the coastal areas. Uh, you can compare that to the Wailai East aquifer on the east end near Makapu, uh, 2 million gallons a day. Because there's less rainfall in that area, the sustainable yield is a lot smaller. Uh, so this is what we try, we depend on for our water supply for the island of Oahu, these underground aquifers. And the Red Hill fuel facility uh, was, is located, uh, most of the facility, all 20 tanks, including most of the pipelines that connect the tanks to Pearl Harbor are actually over the aquifer itself in the area between the Mauna Loa aquifer sector and the Waimalu sectors. 20 tanks sitting on end in an, uh, constructed in place or what they call field constructed, built in, uh, built in place by the US Navy uh, in between 1940 and 1943. Uh, the work continued 24 seven uh, it only stopped when uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked on December 7th, but it continued throughout that period. And in three years, they built this massive underground facility, which was secret to the island because we were entering the uh, World War II at the time. Uh, 20 tanks, each tank is 250 feet tall, 100 feet across or in diameter. Uh, and you can basically fit Aloha Tower into the tank easily. 
Each tank could hold up to 12 and a half million gallons of fuel. Uh, keeping the fuel in the tank and from leaking out in the, to the environment was a steel liner. And that steel liner was only a quarter inch thick uh, steel that was welded together to form the seal that uh, kept the fuel in the tanks uh, from leaking out. Uh, it was surrounded by many feet of concrete to provi provide structural stability and to help uh, prevent the steel from rusting. But, uh, but like anything else, uh, something 80 years old, of course, water going to get in between the steel and the concrete and the concrete can crack over time. Uh, so that's quarter inch steel plate, which is about the, the thickness of your little finger or your pinky uh, is actually corroding from the outside uh, inwards. The facility was secret up to 1995 uh, and about half a mile downhill uh, from this massive fuel storage facility uh, is actually the Navy's drinking water source, which has uh, been impacted uh, from last year. Um, and that provides water to, uh, to the Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. Important point on this uh, slide is that the bottoms of the tanks are only about 100 feet above the water table of the aquifer. Now this is looking downwards uh, toward uh, the Red Hill facility. Uh, those num uh, dashed circles with numbers in them represent the two rows of 10 tanks each. And it's connected by that dashed line, which is the lower tunnel carrying three large fuel pipelines, welded steel pipe, all the way down to Pearl Harbor, about three and a half miles away. Uh, and coincidentally, I mentioned that about a half a mile below the tanks uh, is the Navy's drinking water source. And this source provides 20, 24% of the supply for Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. And look at the location. Uh, at that black dot is 2254-01. Um, that little black dot there represents the pump room. And that pump room uh, contains these large pumps that pump water into, from the aquifer below. Uh, just 100 feet below uh, into the water system for Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. That pump room is actually directly connected to the lower tunnel carrying the fuel pipelines to and from Pearl Harbor. Uh, so at the time that they built the Red Hill facility, they also decided to build a water source uh, for their base for Pearl Harbor. And what we see circled there in red, an important thing is the infiltration gallery. So this this Red Hill shaft is like our Halava shaft. If you've ever been into Halava shaft, you'll see that the, we pump water from the near the top of the water table of the aquifer below. Uh, same thing, in, in this infiltration gallery is a horizontal tunnel that was dug almost a thousand, over a thousand feet long, submer fully submerged in the water table. So when you turn on the pumps at uh, that black dot 2254-01, which is by the way, the state well number for the Red Hill shaft, uh, it sucks water from this tunnel from the aquifer. Uh, and what they suspect is that the leaks uh, that occurred maybe May and November of last year, uh, that the leaks uh, actually got into that lower access tunnel from a pipe that was broken, a drain pipe that shouldn't have contained fuel, but did contain fuel according to the Navy, and it spilled onto the floor of that lower tunnel. This lower tunnel is almost directly over the infiltration gallery tunnel of the Red Hill drinking water source. So it rapidly seeped down through the, the 100 foot or so of unsaturated lava rock, what we call the Vedal zone, and seeped into their drinking water source uh, and was pumped out into their water system for Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. So they did a, uh, they drilled holes in the floor, the concrete floor of that tunnel, and they monitored uh, vapor levels uh, in there, and they detected uh, four locations or four hotspots where the vapor levels, because of fuel, uh, uh, they indicated four hotspots of uh, heavy, uh, higher fuel contamination. And I'm, I'm sharing this uh, from my conversations with the Navy when I went in there, also visited the Red Hill facility probably over a dozen times over the eight years uh, that I've been working on this issue uh, from 2014. And uh, this is kind of consistent with the explanation they told us uh, while we were visiting the tunnel. So right now they're trying to recover the aquifer, uh, clean it up, it's heavily contaminated. If you go down into this tunnel and you look in, down the shaft of Red Hill, uh, the Red Hill well, the Red Hill shaft, you'll be able to see that 
They're right, right now trying to remove the fuel that's present in the shaft itself. Um, free product or, or fuel floating on the water, uh, fuel uh, dripping from the sides of the tunnel, uh, a emulsion of fuel and water uh, floating on uh, in in that water uh, in that water source, that drinking former drinking water source. This is now looking top down over Halava Valley uh, from the Mauna Loa side on the on the bottom toward the, the Halava side on the other side. Uh, you can see the two rows of ten black dots that represents the fuel for storage tanks. Uh, you can see Red Hill Shaft. Uh, you can also see BWS, the Board of Water Supply nearest wells uh, on either side. To the south is Mauna Loa Wells, about a three million gallon a day source. Uh, to the northwest of the Red Hill Fuel Facility, less than a mile away is our Halava Shaft, which is one of our largest uh, sources for urban Honolulu, uh, between six and 12 million gallons a day from that. Uh, source, and then also our IEA wells, Halava wells, and IEA Gulf wells. Circled in red are the three BWS wells that are currently shut down. The common point of intersection between the Board of Water Supply and the Navy is really the underground aquifer. We both pump from the same aquifer. These wells, their wells, uh, also pump from the same aquifer as the BWS wells. And we know that the the aquifer near Red Hill shaft is heavily contaminated uh, uh, because of the amount of fuel that's in the shaft itself uh, and the potential that maybe 19 or 20,000 gallons of fuel might have leaked right there. But we also know that uh, below the fuel tanks, they have a record a history of leaks over the almost 80 years of history of the facility that the aquifer there is also contaminated. The thing that uh, really, um, um, is the million dollar question for us is, you know, uh, can fuel contamination that, uh, emanating from this facility, from the tanks or the pipelines that leak out, can it travel in the underground aquifer through the porous lava rock, uh, the same aquifer that we both use and cross over to, the, to our sources and be, pumped, uh, and be uh, pumped into our water system? Uh, so that's the million dollar question. So there's something called a groundwater model. And as for those that are uh, going to college, you will get, or if you get into hydrology and uh, hydraulics, uh, you know, you, you'll start to see something called uh, computer simulation models. So the uh, computer hydro, uh, 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 groundwater models are like a, a representation of the real world conditions. In the real world, the underground geology is very complex. So in a way you create a computer model that'll be used as a tool to help, help you analyze different situations. So this under, uh, uh, groundwater model is something that the Navy has been working on for several years uh, in review of the Department of Health and the US EPA and BWS has provided comments. The Navy's contention is that, uh, and normally this is the case that uh, water flowing is usually flowing from the Malka, from the watersheds, down toward the Makai, toward the ocean, and it flows that way until it hits the cap rock and it leaks out to the cap rock at springs or uh, uh, other locations. Uh, but it basically Malka to Makai. So you can see the blue arrows here. So that's the Navy's groundwater model that they contend that the fuel leaks from the Red Hill facility won't make it across Halava Valley to our Halava shaft or other wells in that area. Uh, and that they feel it'll all flow toward their Red Hill shaft. So we contend that there is a potential, and this is based on field data collected uh, from field tests coordinated by the USGS, the United States Geological Survey, working with the BWS, the Navy, uh, and DLNR, uh, that we felt, feel that the, uh, there is enough field data to support there is a potential for cross, what we call cross valley flow. So flow from to the Northwest. So fuel leaks from the Red Hill facility, we feel could migrate eventually across Halava Valley. And because of that, we have secured the three wells that are in that direction uh, because we cannot afford to put contaminated, petroleum contaminated water into our water system. And in Honolulu, we probably serve over 400,000 people from Halava all the way up to Hawaii Kai. Uh, also the Aia Halava wells serve the area from uh, Iva Anna Street uh, west uh, to Hikaha Street and Aia. So that includes Pearl Ridge Shopping Center and uh, Polymomi Hospital. 
So the Navy also did with their groundwater model, they did some what they call parter, particle track modeling. Uh, so if there was a particle of fuel from Red Hill, uh, from the Red Hill fuel facility, uh, where would it, where could it possibly go? And they did many of those model runs, out, which is represented by each of these colored lines. But you can clearly see, at least from this, and uh, that the uh, their particle track model runs uh, did indicate the potential for fuel to fuel particles to eventually get across the valley and to get to our BWS wells and also get to their Red Hill shaft. And that other white box kind of in the middle left portion of the page is what we think is their IA Halava shaft, which is currently shut off to, uh, but eventually make it all the way up to Pearl Harbor at Kalawal Springs and to Pearl Harbor. Uh, I just want to caveat this, uh, you know, the, the regulators, the Department of Health and EPA have not uh, gave final approval for this report, uh, but this is a report that was uh, actually released in 2020. Uh, so on that basis, using the precautionary principle, because we cannot get this wrong, uh, we cannot put fuel contaminated water into our drinking water system and, go, and, and it to uh, go into people's homes and businesses, uh, that we're taking the approach of shutting off the uh, three closest wells. We are testing these wells, um, actually five wells around this fuel facility on a weekly basis. And uh, thus far, we have not detected fuel at any uh, fuel contamination in these wells and yet, as of yet. Uh, now, what's happened with the Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam water system? And this is actually from the Navy's own website for Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, uh, showing a water system flushing zone map. Uh, so all these areas indicate areas that uh, fuel contamination may have migrated uh, into their water system all the way out from the Pearl City side, all the way out to uh, Pua Road side, and going Mackay all the way to Iroquois Point and to uh, the, the mouth of Pearl Harbor uh, in the Hickam area. Uh, you can see that they, their water system, which is pretty extensive, but not as extensive as a BWS system, but they've had to now figure out how to systematically try to flush out the contamination uh, that got into their water system from, from the Red Hill fuel facility. It is a pretty, uh, uh, a pretty uh, complicated process. First, they flush the pipes, the water, what we call the water mains or their distribution system. Then once they, that test uh, samples taken after they flush, they come back uh, okay that there's no fuel contamination or the fuel contamination is below a certain level. Then they can proceed to flush the individual homes uh, and businesses and, and facilities on the base. Uh, and they test that. Uh, and only finally after the uh, the Department of Health EPA agree with the Navy's results, uh, actions and results, will they allow people to come back into their homes? And right now I think uh, there's quite a, or there's thousands of people that have been displaced uh, uh, from their homes into hotels or other locations on the island. And, uh, you know, I, and this I'll keep in mind, this all occurred around Thanksgiving uh, when they started to actually detect the fuel in their drinking water, they started to smell it or taste it. It started to see health effects. Uh, we even started to get calls on November 28th to our control center here on a Sunday evening. I remember those calls coming in and um, I, I thought, oh no. So my worst fears have come to pass. So this basically, there is a health advisory issue by the Department of Health. Basically it's uh, do not drink or do not use for like oral hygiene, or if you smell fuel, you shouldn't even use it to uh, bathe in. Um, and so the, they have to go through this whole flushing process and testing to get, it, to get the health department comfortable to be able to uh, amend their health advisory, which is affecting the entire Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam which serves almost, I think I've heard about 93,000 people. Uh, this is a terrible situation, but you can see the level of effort they have to go through uh, to do this. Uh, one thing I can say that uh, the, the Department of Defense has a lot bigger budget than the Board of Water Supply, something like a, 
almost a thousand times bigger than our, our budget. So we have no way the kind of resources that they have. So our only approach that we can take is to keep the fuel out. And the only way for us to keep the fuel from fuel contaminated water from getting into our system is to not turn on our wells and pump into our water system. Uh, this is a kind of a picture of our water system of the low service system serving the lower elevations in Honolulu, urban Honolulu uh, from the Halawa area all the way out to uh, Hawaii Kai and East Honolulu. Uh, these blue lines represent the pipelines in that system, you know, that go from six inches in diameter all the way up to 42 inches in diameter, almost four feet across. Um, and this includes areas like Waikiki, downtown Honolulu, uh, Hawaii Kai. Um, so Halava Shaft was, uh, represents about 20% of our supply for this urban Honolulu system. We have some wells uh, within Honolulu, but as Honolulu grew over, over the years, its demand outstripped the supply available within the Honolulu area. So our Kali pump station, Veritania, while their wells, Kamati pump stations uh, can provide for part of the demand for urban Honolulu, but we have to bring water from Pearl Harbor, from west, from the Pearl Harbor aquifer into Honolulu. Uh, so there are even other wells that are to the upper left corner of the slide that are not shown here, like Kalawao wells, Punanani wells, Hikawaiao tunnel, uh, Kaamilo. Uh, those are also wells that help pump water to meet the demand for Honolulu. The Navy did a study to assess the risks. This is part of the administrative order and consent that was agreed upon in 2015 between the Navy, Defense Logistics Agency, the Department of Health and US EPA as a voluntary agreement that they uh, put into place after the 2014 leak of 27,000 from tank uh, five. In this quantitative risk uh, assessment study, uh, they took the same methodology that they use for evaluating nuclear facilities, and they came up with these probabilities of uh, releases. First bullet is 27% probability of a sudden release between 1,000 and 30,000 gallons of fuel each year, um, which is fairly high uh, probability. And that's, I think, what we're seeing right now, potentially a 19 or 20,000 gallon leak uh, just uh, last year greater than the 34% chance of a more than 120,000 gallon fuel release in the next 100 years, 5% probability of more than a 1 million gallon uh, release in the next 100 years. Uh, you really wanna get these probabilities as low as you possibly can. Um, you think these are uh, alarmingly high. Um, there's also the probability here that there are chronic or recurring leaks each year of about 5,800 gallons that, uh, that are too low for the Navy to be able to detect uh, those leaks. Recent releases you know, in the history uh, uh, that was of documents that was uh, shared in the ALC process, you know, the 72 releases uh, over the 80 year history that we can find documentation for. Uh, the earliest occurred, I think, in 1948. Uh, we found a report by Bechtel uh, indicating a leak of, I think, about 44,000 gallons from uh, one of the tanks there. And in 1948, it was only five years old at the time. Um, then in January 2014, when I first became aware of it as a manager, I took office on 2012, uh, this uh, leak of 27,000 gallons from tank number five. Uh, then additional releases all the way up to from March 2020 up to 2021. I uh, keep in mind, you know, some of these releases are at Pearl Harbor. So the fuel is brought in through Pearl Harbor on tankers or, or barges, uh, and it's unloaded at Pearl Harbor and then pumped all the way three and a half mil miles uphill to the tanks. And when they want to bring fuel back from the tanks to Pearl Harbor, they just open up the valves and they float by gravity because the tanks are much higher than sea level than Pearl Harbor itself. They've also had problems of fuel releases at uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. The Department of Health looks at a, this fuel facility as including all, all the pipelines, all the facilities that are, are part of this Red Hill uh, fuel storage facility. So that includes the 
uh, pipelines down at Pearl Harbor. Uh, in 2021, May 6th, they experienced a pressure surge. Uh, I don't know if there's any engineers uh, or engineers to be uh, on this call, but uh, pressure surge is like what we call a water hammer in the water business. So picture that you are using water at home, you hear the faucet wide open, and then suddenly you shut it off really quickly, like in a second or two, and then you hear your pipes rattle, you hear a sound. Uh, that's because water was flowing at, in one direction at a high rate, and you carried so much momentum or mat, uh, that when you shut it down, uh, it hit the closed valve of your faucet, and then it created a pressure wave that reflected backwards to your plumbing in your home, rattling your pipes. So that happened actually on a larger scale on a 16 inch diameter JP5 or Jet Fuel 5 uh, pipeline in the lower access tunnel. And that pressure surge uh, reverberated uh, through that three and a half miles of pipeline and found a weak spot, which happened to be a, a section of pipeline just outside of tank number five. And when I went to visit on December 15, I saw that this five foot long section of 16 inch pipe kind of blew off of its couplings. It was connected by couplings and uh, steel bolts. I blew it off of that and it hit the wall and fuel came rushing out of it. Uh, they, they estimated that the, uh, uh, in 50 seconds, about 19,000 gallons of fuel was released from tank number 20. You know, I converted that to gallon. Now, I'm a I'm a water engineer, so I think about gallons per minute. That tells me how much, uh, how high the flow rate is. So I converted that, you do just doing some basic math and it came out to something like, if it was for a one minute period, it would have been like 24,000 gallons a minute uh, flowed out of that broken 16 inch diameter pipe. Uh, when you ask, uh, what does 24,000 gallons a minute look like? Sometimes, you know, people, car uh, meets the fire hydrant on the street, on the side of the street and the, and the hydrant loses and the car takes out the hydrant and you have this geyser of water uh, come up maybe a hundred feet in the air. Um, that might be 2000 gallons a minute coming out of there or maybe 3000. Uh, just picture that you had 12 fire hydrants broken at the same time all alongside one another and creating this massive geyser of water. Picture that as JP5 coming out of that broken 16 inch pipe. And that happened only in 50 seconds before they were able to close the valve. Um, in September of 2021, they also had a situation where they experienced the same kind of pressure surges in their pipelines. So as a precaution, they shut down the facility for nine days uh, because they were concerned about failures there. And in 2021, another failure on a drain line that drains normally fuel and foam, I mean, uh, water and foam uh, from the tunnel, from the fire suppression system that leaked out uh, what they estimated at the time was about 14,000 gallons. So the question there was if connected to the May event could have been closer to 19 or 20,000 gallons. And this is the history of uh, some of the events related to this contamination, this uh, environmental disaster at Red Hill. Uh, and how it affected the Navy and the Board of Water Supply. So the emergency order from the Department of Health, we support this uh, and the Navy has indicated uh, at least verbally that they will comply with the order, although they have not ruled out the uh, potential for a legal challenge. So we're watching it very closely if they uh, will be submitting a legal challenge. Uh, we hope that they don't. Um, you know, a reporter from one of the news stations kind of caught me off guard once with a question on an interview last year. He asked me, do you trust the Navy? And I had to really think, had to kind of really think because what do I say into that, with that question? Do I trust the Navy? And everybody on television is watching. Um, so I just simply responded with trust is earned. So the Navy, by their words, you cannot you have to see if their actions will match their words. So their actions will help rebuild trust. So my hope is that the Navy will not fight the emergency order and will comply fully with the order and with the timelines uh, that are set by the order. Uh, so that's how they, I think they have a chance of rebuilding some of the trust. Uh, but if they, their words are empty 
and their actions do not substantiate their words, and then I, I think they're going to have trust problems going forward. And the issue for us is uh, the Navy needs to uh, shut down the facility. Uh, they need to defuel it, empty out the fuel from those tanks and pipelines as soon as possible, because uh, for every minute, every hour, every day that the fuel is still stored there, 100% over our aquifer, or 100 feet above our aquifer, it is a risk to our aquifer for further contamination, maybe even worse contamination of our drinking, precious drinking water resource, our precious VI. Um, so they need to look at relocating their fuel away from the aquifer. And, and our position now is don't bring it back, keep it away. Find a location that is over the Caprock area where if it leaks, it won't endanger our aquifer, our fresh water, our VI, our source of our drinking water. Um, our drinking water is a precious gift. We need to malama this gift and to be able to leave it for the future generations. And, and that's all I had. Uh, are there any questions? Oh, I can stop sharing. And I just want to mahalo you uh, so much for joining us today. And we have a lot of people joining us on Facebook. We have some people who have um, hopped on through the Zoom uh, link so that they can watch here as well. Um, and it's just, I think that this is such a great presentation that you gave because many of us understand the concept of how we get our water here in Hawaii. We understand the concept in its broadest sense, but we don't know the details of how the water is pumped, where it's stored. Um, and it, I think your presentation was just amazing um, in sharing that with us and helping to educate us on this issue. Um, I'm gonna say one thing that really stood out to me was the thickness of my pinky because I have sat on chairs and broke legs that are thicker than my pinky. So um, that, that kind of just really stood out to me. I'm gonna open this up to our OPIL. Um, you are the next generation. Uh, we're fighting this so that not just you can have clean water, but of course, your children and your children's children can have clean water as well. So, in now, Opia, Auhia, Valia, Uko. You know, we have some uh, awesome, we have some familiar faces. Actually, you know what? I call on my, why don't I introduce you, the Opio who are here today? Because we have a bunch of, Familiar faces and those of you who have been with us on these OPO panels may recognize or, or may notice that there have that we have some new faces as well. Um, we do have Hema Watson. Aloha e Hema. Hema comes from Halau Kumana. Um, we have uh, Mema. Aloha. Uh, Garvey. She's from Kaahalahui o Olekona. We have Ifet. He is from Waianae High School, Ao Waianae. We have Lillian Nahoy. She is also from Halau Kumana. And we have uh, Kyla Marie Turner. She's a graduate of Kamehameha Schools on Hawaii Island, and she now attends the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Um, I do know that Ifit had probably has, has a question, and as one of our veterans, I'm gonna allow him to just take it away and ask his question. Uh, mahalo. Um, Mr. Lau, you touched briefly upon the, um, the flushing process of the, that the Navy is going to go through um, for their water distribution system. Um, where would that contaminated water, the, the water that they're flushing out of their system go? From what I understand is that the, uh, uh, there's two places. Uh, one is the environment into the storm drains and eventually into the ocean. Uh, the other one would be uh, into the sewer system, into the wastewater system. So we go into the wastewater treatment plant and then eventually get out into the ocean after treatment. Uh, so for, according to the Navy and what I've seen on, their new, on the news clips, uh, it's being treated through activated carbon before they uh, send it on to the environment. Uh, I'm not sure about the ones that go into the sewer system, if it's just being flushed directly into the sewer system without carbon treatment, but uh, the flushing is uh, going to be challenging. You know, I wish them the best. Uh, when you think about it, you know, in my 
my associate, uh, Mr. Erwin Kawata, who's been with me on this journey for the last eight years, side by side with me, uh, used the analogy of a salad bowl with dressing in it. Uh, and then when you wanna clean out the salad bowl uh, with water, you kind of get the oily film off of the, off the plastic. So if there are any plastic components, and this is what we kind of uh, raised as a question for consideration. Uh, when you're doing the flushing, can you get a, what it, because there are, are sometimes you know, PVC pipe in the distribution system in the mains, there may be other uh, uh, things in the homes that are, are non-metallic uh, that could absorb uh, fuel. Uh, so I think that's something we're going to watch very carefully and I, I wish them the best, but it, I don't think it's going to be easy. Uh, Aloha, uncle. Um... I just had a question about like off of that topic. Um, how would you describe their demeanor? What do you what do you believe you feel their demeanor or attitude is towards um, handling the situation? Because I know I, I think it, I believe it was 2018. Um, they did have uh, do a signed records of leaks, but they decided to not talk about it until you and others pressed about it and forced their hand. I, I do know that they've tried to misdirect the blame and all this other kind of stuff. And I'm, I'm not trying to be too aggressive um, with my opinion on them, but um, I just like to know what you think about them um, and where do you believe uh, they would go if it, let's say if we're not for us. I, I think, you know, Hema, that's a good question. I wanna make it clear that, you know, I understand the importance of our Department of Defense and uh, the military and defending our freedoms. Uh, uh, from oppression, uh, but I also uh, feel that they need to to malama the resources, just like all of us, because we we live here, we depend on these resources for our lives and for generations to come. From my experience in the last eight years, and at first, you know, in 2014, I was trying to figure out, get more information from them to understand what happened, what is it, what's what about this facility? Can you tell me more about the field facility? Oh, but I've seen this kind of pattern where uh, each event they're going to say, uh, well, you know, we've, we've addressed it, uh, we've been aggressive to take care of it, uh, and it'll never happen again. And then comes another event, and they're going to say the same thing. Oh, you know, we're addressing it, we're jumping right on this, we got all these people working on it, we're doing it, and then another thing happens. Uh, rather than dealing with the problem forthrightly, just saying this facility is beyond its useful life. It's 80 years old, built during World War II. So we got to do something that is going to provide, be safer to the resources, to the environment, and provide a much more reliable fuel storage facility for the for Indo-PACOM, for the Pacific, for a long term. But trying to band-aid an 80-year-old facility together, that's like, to me, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, so, Emma, I would say you got to listen really carefully to what they're saying. Listen to the words that they use and how they say it, uh, because they're very skillful in how they say things. Uh, but if, but then you got to also measure it up against their actions. What are they actually going to do? Does the actions match the words? So, Emma, I, you know, I respect the Navy, but uh, like that reporter asked me about trust. I, I, they haven't earned my trust yet. So I, you know, I'm sorry, Navy. I hope I don't offend people with that. But you got to earn my trust. You got to do it by actions. Okay. All right. My next question. Oh, um, my question is kind of going off Hema's and talking about demeanor. Um, my question is, what are the different types of resources that are out there for the Ohanas that are affected by um, the contamination of their drinking water? Because um, not only is their daily lives affected, but also their um, just probably sense of security and their demeanors towards um, having safe drinking water and having that security within their life. So what are different things that not only um, board of water supply is doing but even maybe the government even possibly the navy that you know of if you could elaborate on that a little bit please i can uh, definitely answer for what border border water supply is doing is uh we're we're testing uh weekly uh, but we're also taking some very drastic measures to prevent contamination uh because uh, 
we feel that if we have to react to something, it'll be really difficult. And we don't have the same resources as the Navy. Uh, so we got to prevent, we got to be aggressive in preventing contamination. Uh, but one thing is very important is uh, EK is, is uh, empowering people with knowledge. So we feel that it's all very important to also communicate with all of you, with our customers, with the community and what we are doing, uh, what we're doing, going to be doing going forward to deal with the situation. So communication is very important. Um, uh, so that at least the Board of Water Supply, you know, we're committed to be transparent and to communicate openly with people. And I welcome these opportunities to do Q&A uh, because that's the way people will learn and become empowered and can carry this on to, uh, to future generations. The Navy, uh, I believe, is trying to do what they can do. They have a very, uh, their website is pretty, pretty, actually pretty impressive. It's got a lot of information there. Uh, but it seems like, uh, at least watching the news reports, that how they handle the support that they can provide to the military ohana uh, versus the non-military ohana, there's a difference. Uh, and it's the non-military ohana that seems to be really struggling right now to get support from the federal government, yet they are customers of the federal government's water system. So I think, I, I hope that they can do something because the stories are pretty sad, especially in you know, like the, the, the ohana up, up at Iroquois Point uh, that are many are non-Navy uh, ohana. Uh, Kyla, I hope I answer your question. Thank you. Um, to jump back into kind of piggyback what Kyla asked, um, since there's constant change in power within the Navy, um, is it is the communication with the Board of Water Supply kind of spotty? Because you mentioned in your presentation that they had a leak and they didn't tell you guys. And, you know, I'm just wondering if the communication between the Navy and the Board of Water Supply is just, I'm just wondering like what, what that's like. Uh, well, it's a, uh, number one, they, they, from the very beginning, they want us to sign something called a non-disclosure agreement, which is they can share information with you, but you cannot tell anybody unless you sign this non-disclosure agreement. Uh, we said no. You know, we're a public agency. We serve our community. So our community needs to know about the situation. Uh, so we're not going to sign a NDA. Um, the, the other thing, too, is that we know that we suspect that we, there is much more information. And we've been trying to get that information for the last eight years uh, to get more information. Uh, but it's been like pulling teeth. Uh, very frankly, it's been very difficult to get information out. Um, right now, you know, they say that they're testing their monitor wells, uh, but we don't have a lot of data from their these monitor wells that have been drilled to monitor underground contamination in the aquifer and the groundwater. Uh, we haven't gotten access to current information. They posted some for about three wells but there are almost 17 or 18 other wells that we haven't seen any data since I think around the middle of last year, which was before the leak occurred, uh, the November event. So uh, I think you pointed out to you the change, you know, one of the challenges we've seen over the eight years is every two years, the military command ro rotates out. They move to a different assignment someplace else in the world at another base. So they don't have any consistency there in the leadership. The civilian workers, I think, are doing their best, uh, but they operate under bosses that rotate every two years. So you can imagine if you were working for somebody that the boss changed every two years, uh, it, it would be uh, must be challenging. It's also the issue is uh, can those people that come in only for a two year, maybe three at the most, really absorb all the information about this massive facility, uh, the information that dates back almost 80 years. Can they master that in, in a few months? Erin um, uh, and I have been on this for eight consecutive years. So I think in one way we, we have some knowledge that uh, even some of these officers may not understand about the facility just because we've been on it for eight years. So 
Lillian, I, I think I just rambled off, off topic there. Sorry about that. Are, are there any other questions? <laughs> yes, I have a question for you. Um, so Mr. Lau for, so it's kind of connecting back to Kyla's question, but what type of resources do you recommend for Ohana that's outside of Hawaii that are still wanting to support their Lahui? And because there's so much they, that they can do, but there's also a limited amount with the situation that they're in. Yeah, it's a good question. I know that uh, we, it's very important that we all speak with one voice. I mean, we don't have to be 100% exactly the same, uh, but if we are paddling in the same direction and with, you know, with one voice, one rhythm, uh, then we can move mountains here uh, together. So the Lahui uh, out of state, uh, they can still reach out to our congressional delegation, our elected officials in Hawaii and make their voice sound through uh, social media, through other ways that they can communicate. They can participate now with pandemic. We've all become used to virtual meetings. Uh, so there's nothing to say that they cannot participate and testify and share their mana about the, uh, protecting our, our precious by, uh, or protecting this gift. So that those are some ways. Uh, there's also, you know, the decisions go back to Washington, DC. Uh, to the Pentagon, to Congress, and to the president. Uh, so those uh, those that are even in those areas that can participate in that process, you know, uh, it's hard for us to travel, you know, 5,000, 4,000, 5,000 miles, and under a pandemic, it's very difficult. But you can participate. Uh, maybe the, the Lahui there can uh, make their voice known in protection of our resource. We will need funding to solve this problem. This is a federal facility, so it really will need Congress providing the funds uh, to the Navy to address this problem. So, thank you for the question. Okay. I have a question. Uh, how much petroleum can be detected in water for it to be deemed acceptable for drinking? Uh, you know, that's a very good question, Joshua. The, um, uh, originally, when we got uh, involved here, I, I remember the Department of Health telling me uh, that 100 parts per billion for like diesel in drinking water is at the, at the level that you can start to smell or taste it. Um, that the, when we did a, uh, a toxicological research on, on what is safe uh, to be in drinking water before it creates negative health effects, you know, we came up with something, I think around 160 parts per billion or around 200 parts per billion. Uh, but un unfortunately, the levels were raised by the Department of Health a few years ago uh, to higher levels. Uh, I understand uh, that the ideal is to not have any fuel in the drinking water. And that's the best uh, to, but if you have to live with contamination, uh, these are the numbers that I, I, at least I'm aware of. Um, 100, at 100 parts per billion for diesel, you can start to taste it or smell it. Uh, for jet uh, gasoline, it might be a little different, uh, but in our minds that you, you do not want your customers to be able to smell or taste fuel in the drinking water, uh, then that does not build trust in the resource. So operate at the lowest possible level of uh, safety as possible. Um, I just had a question. It, it kind of popped in mind after you talked about the Navy's, um, I'm going to say like shady business dealings when they ask for an NDA. Um, to me, that doesn't feel very secure or very trustworthy or responsible of them. Um, and I was just having a question. Um, what means do we have, like is your uh, commission and, and whatnot have to extract uh, that information? Um, and to what extent do you believe um, do you think the military can go and continue operations or do such things uh, before it reaches your eyes or our eyes? Because to me, when someone gives out a non-disclosure agreement, it's either to protect the, uh, the, the secrecy of a thing or to uh, ensure that no one else spills the stuff you're going to tell them. 
Um, and that usually means it's not something that people would want to hear that would benefit the other person. Um, so I was just wondering uh, on those two things. Yeah, you know, when the, the, the requests from the NDA came out, we really struggled with that. Uh, we experienced a lot of pressure to try to sign something. Uh, uh, so that they could share information freely with us, but uh, we absolutely refuse. Uh, it is not the right thing to do be, to be transparent. Uh, and this, you know, in my mind, this facility was declassified in 1995. So you better have a good reason for redacting stuff uh, uh, from a report uh, because this is a no longer a classified facility. Uh, it was declassified by the military. So unless there's a good reason, a procurement, uh, issue or security issue, then really you should, they should share that information. We've had to use FOIA requests or Freedom of Information Act requests. Uh, and we, we used to uh, FOIA the Department of Health uh, or, or that would be a 92F, HRS 92F request uh, or a FOIA request to the US EPA, a FOIA request to the Navy. Um, uh, so the, those are some of the legal tools that we've had to use. But beyond that, we kind of really force them to uh, divulge the information. Uh, one thing I, 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 and I, you know, through the years we've worked closely with the Department of Health and the EPA. Uh, so I just say that, I just hope that the, and I, I think I'm optimistic that our health department and EPA will be uh, very assertive in their approach with the Navy and not go easy on them. Hold them accountable uh, because that's that's their job. That's their responsive. That's their kuleana. Um, because I cannot do this by myself. Uh, am I, we don't have any legal authority over the Navy. We don't have a legal hammer on them. Uh, so I need the regulators to be the hammer, uh, to be assertive. Uh, so transparency or information has always been a struggle with this facility. And, and the the potential deliberate cover-up of information, you know, that's very disconcerting. Uh, that does not build uh, trust and, and faith. Mahalo, Mr. Lau. Um, I'm reading a question for uh, Na'alehu Anthony. Um, they write, Ernie, could you talk a little bit about the potential long-term consequences of this leak both for the economics of it and the amount of water we have to use to drink. Okay, Na'alehu is uh, one of my board members. So thank you, Na'alehu, for that, uh, Lehu for that uh, question. Uh, so the consequences, so we, I said earlier, three wells have been shut down because we cannot risk putting any uh, contaminated water into our water system. Uh, those three wells together represent about around 13.7 million gallons a day of capacity we've lost. Uh, so that's not water we no longer have available to meet the demands of Honolulu and the Aia Halawa community. Uh, so we have to make it up. And the only ways to make it up is by going to our other wells that also feed in the system and pumping them longer. So basically pumping them harder. Uh, but there's a limitation on how much we can uh, pump them harder or rely upon them harder to make up that lost capacity because we have to watch the salinity of the aquifer. If the aquifer starts to, if the water coming out of the well starts to get saltier, we have to back off from the pumping rates because we don't want to permanently damage the aquifer at that location. Uh, so that, that's one thing. So that's uh, adjusting supply and, and possibly trying to bring other wells that don't normally feed these areas uh, by modifying how we operate our system, connecting it with pipelines or other ways uh, opening valves, uh, trying to move water around. Uh, but also on the demand side, we're asking people to look at water conservation, to only use what they need to use and not waste it. Fix leaks, don't over-irrigate. Uh, if it rains, you know, don't, don't let your sprinkler system just run after a rain uh, has happened. Uh, make use of the good uh, ua from the heavens. Um, the, Implications though are that uh, what we are obligated to do, we are obligated to meet the needs of our current existing water customers in these systems first before we meet the needs of future customers. So 
if we're going to continue to serve new development, new customers, we have to be able to do it in a way that we won't uh, negatively affect the quality of the water service to, we have to our existing customers, which are residents, businesses, uh, government entities uh, in our system, industrial, commercial customers. Uh, we, we have a lot of customers in these systems, so we have to be able to uh, uh, support them and still make room for new development. So we're looking very carefully at how much new growth we can add to the system while we look at new wells to be drilled elsewhere that won't be affected by the fuel contaminated uh, aquifer from emanating from Red Hill or fuel contaminated water. Um, and, and we may also have to look at treatment systems to see if we can treat the water and move the fuel from the water. So the economic impacts are, I think, uh, I don't think people have a quite an appreciation. Drilling new wells will take years to do. Uh, that is our experience. It doesn't go, can go a little faster, but it still is years of, uh, to develop and go through the process. Mahalo, Mr. Lau. Um, I have a question from some of our folks over at Kanayokana. Um, what are your thoughts on the Halava River Discharge Plan? I'm sorry, can you repeat that, Joshua? Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Halava River Discharge Plan? Oh, is this the, uh, the pumping of Red Hill shaft to try to get the fuel out of it, uh, send it to, again, uh, activated carbon tanks for filtering before discharging to a Halava stream? Um, I guess I understand what they're trying to do there. Um, I, I'm not sure how successful they will be because the level of contamination is like um, uh, for TPH diesel, I think it was like 130,000 parts per billion, uh, some enormous amount. And there's free product floating on the water in the shaft. Uh, also, I, I'd like to see, uh, I guess, how effective the carbon treatment system is. Uh, how quickly will they have to replace the carbon if it's uh, fully used up? Uh, can they replace it? They have to watch it very carefully so as the uh, discharge coming from after filtration will not be uh, damaging to the environment. Uh, these, of course, are going to have to be regulated very closely by the Department of Health. So I think the Navy is trying to get an MPDS permit, uh, National Pollution Elimination Discharge System permit uh, from the Department of Health to be able to do this. So I I don't know, Joshua, I wish him the best. <laughs> that, that fuel, uh, that shaft is really heavily contaminated. And that's the shaft that the Navy divers were going into. And they were trying to vacuum out the fuel from the top of the water and from the, they use absorbent pads to absorb the fuel that they saw in that uh, drinking water source. Mahalo, Mr. Lau. Um, I had a question kind of pertaining to that um, and kind of going back to when we were talking about in your presentation about relocation and the best place for relocation would be um, somewhere near the cap rock. Um, so in regards to that, if we were, if the Navy were, I should say, to relocate fuel tanks to over the cap rock and it would leak, how would that pose a threat to uh, marine life? what exactly would that look like? And are there procedures in place, even just thought processes in place on what to do if that were to happen? Yeah, we, we think they should construct above ground storage tanks, uh, not like Red Hill, which is a massive underground facility, very difficult to maintain or even reconstruct in place. Uh, so the underground, uh, above ground storage tanks should be built uh, uh, with the appropriate uh, current safety measures in place uh, to control releases and monitor for releases, but sometimes that'll happen. Uh, uh, and I think they've had problems before in Pearl Harbor, but we think it's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, you know, this is, I want to be very careful here. I, I'm an advocate for, advocate for safe drinking water. And that's my mission. That's my, that's my dedication. That's my kuleana. Uh, but I also realize the protection of the environment, including our marine environment, the near shore waters, the, 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 the flora and fauna along Pearl Harbor is also very important. Um, 
So it just would have to be done very carefully to ensure there are appropriate safety systems in place um, uh, to do that and close monitoring. I think also some of the fuel could be located in areas that are industrial, uh, that are already in areas that are heavily industrial, like Campbell Industrial Park. So taking the fuel out of the Red Hill tanks, we've always thought that it could be a hybrid solution. It could go to Navy property, new constructed tanks uh, on Navy property, uh, or it could go to private storage in Campbell Industrial Park, or it could go to other locations, even on ships or other locations around the Pacific. So uh, why does it need to continue to be all located 100 feet over our aquifer? So, but you're right though, uh, consideration needs to be done more broadly, kind of going back to Joshua's concerns or question about the discharges into a halawa stream. Uh, uh, I think the health department will have to watch it very carefully to make sure there's not any negative effects on um, uh, stream users uh, of that stream, halawa stream, you know, fishermen and others, uh, or the marine life that uh, exists around that stream. And I, I grew up in Waipahu, like I said earlier, I fished in Pearl Harbor uh, and I ate the fish there too, even though I think right now I should have eat, not eaten as much uh, fish, especially kaku or papil. Um, but uh, those all things need to be considered. Um, I have a question for you, Mr. Lau. So going back to Eolai Kavai or Malamai Kuhunua for our next generations, something that we could reconnect to is Himilin Okane, where we're asking um, Ayayi Heakavai Okane, where is our fresh waters of Kane? And so if we go further into the future and we still see our next generations in the position, in the position we are currently in right now, I believe we're truly going to ask this question for our um, our appeal in the next generation. And so back to Ahua Olelo that you mentioned in your presentation. Um, is my Wi-Fi okay? Am I cutting out? Uh, you're okay. good. Okay, good. So one of the Hua Olelo that you mentioned in your presentation was Bye Bye. And so as we reflect and continue to see our um, water resources or um, the forms of nourishment for our bodies destroyed, what do you think the term vai vai means in the future? I think it'll become even more important uh, and, and vital that we, we learn that concept uh, uh, that we start to live it. The, the situation of Red Hill, you have to also superimpose climate change on it too. That's the other factor we're dealing with. So with climate change, our freshwater resources may become even more precious and more limited. Uh, so we have to prevent it from further contamination, keep it as pure as possible. So the next generations, we need to teach uh, and pass on that knowledge, that EK to them, uh, to ensure that uh, they understand and they can carry on the mission. Um, what I say here, Red Hill, I've been at it for eight years. I just say everybody, you know, this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. And from what I've seen over the last eight years, this will take time and we need to be steadfast in our approach. So, so I think uh, the concept of Vai Vai uh, becomes even greater and we're, we're gonna be embracing it more at the Board of Water Supply. And that Olelo actually is on the, the sculpture outside of the engineering building at the Board of Water Supply, which is the first headquarters for BWS back in 1920, uh, built in the 1930s. Uh, the story of the waters of Kane. So I, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, mahalo. Um... Thinking about alternatives, because we, we recently brought that off, uh, up in like the revitalization of Hawaii. Um, and you know, this may seem far-fetched, but is there any energy or thought being invested into moving away from extracting waters from aquifers um, and you know, even like restoring um, watersheds as an alternative? And you know, secondly, um, and we talked about this, if we were to drain uh, Kapu Kaki, um, where might the fuel go? Like, would it be burnt and the tanks not refilled? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, going back to your first part of your question, you know, our watersheds are crucially in, important um, because they really are like the sponges of Malka that soak in the, the, the rain, the ua, but also the fog that, of the clouds I help to recharge the aquifer. Uh, so it's, it's vitally important that we continue to invest in our watersheds island-wide, statewide uh, for our communities. Uh, because if you don't have a healthy watershed, uh, you will not, uh, you will have limited water resources uh, and water will just, when it falls, it'll run off into the oceans rapidly and not percolate or soak into the ground, into the underground aquifer. So we, that's very important. Um, I'm sorry, uh, can you repeat your other part of your question there? <laughs> okay. Um, if we were to drain a kapukaki, where might the fuel go? Like, would it be burnt and the vats just not refilled? Or is that, you know, something way far down the line? I, I don't know where it might go. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, to other storage opportunities. So kind of a hybrid approach, but it ultimately be up to the Navy to decide uh, where they're going to move the fuel to. Uh, we want them to drain it as soon as possible and remove the threat to our water resource. Um, in the future, I know I don't think this is part of your questions. You know, uh, one of the things that the uh, the city and county was doing is uh, the council passed an ordinance that uh, uh, allowed us uh, is supporting the concept of one water, uh, where we approach that one water is all water, all fresh water of all different forms, you know, wastewater, storm water, drinking water. We treat it as a resource. Uh, so rather than just tapping these underground aquifers to pump fresh water out of it to meet the needs of our community, uh, we continue to develop uh, reuse of wastewater, which is currently just most of it's flowing into the ocean, except for what we reuse on the Eva Plain. Uh, and we need to uh, uh, try to manage stormwater better to uh, reduce the amount that flows into the ocean, keep it on, on, our, on our homes, on our lands and reuse it on site uh, if possible. Um, so taking the one water approach will be uh, important to the future generations uh, because I, I, I'm kind of approaching the end of my career here. This Red Hill is like one last, uh, one last stand for Ernie Lau here to try to protect our water resources, but it really, it'll be all of you out there uh, in this media and that are listening that will have to carry this on to future generations. Uh, because the effort of working together is going to become even more important as we face the challenges of our future of our planet. Um, I just like to know, um, that was a beautiful answer, but um, I just like to know, um, the, the military and the Navy in general has done a lot of damage, not even just through Kapuka Key, but through a lot of other uh, facets and, and, and paths. Um, and a lot of it has gone un, uh, unnoticed, or even if it is noticed, uh, not reprimanded towards them. Um, and I was just um, thinking, now this is a bit far-fetched and the implementation may not be able to go through plan as the military has quite large force, um, but some kind of uh, overwatch or third-party entity or uh, observation at the very least, um, what, what do you think your thoughts would be? How do you think the viability for uh, a type of system like that would, would, uh, would be? Like, how viable do you think that would be? Um, because at this rate, the military, while, can, while it can be held accountable for things that we see, um, for the things you don't see, it cannot be. Um, and that's kind of what scares a lot of people because while we may see what we have right now, I guarantee you there are probably a dozen other things that we do not know about. Um, that could be potentially uh, adverse to all the people in a way. So I just want to know your your uh, thoughts on how viable do you think a third party solution could be? I, I think it's a uh, Hema. Just to be very frank on that, it could be very challenging because we're talking about a uh, in our country we have you know uh, federal, state, and local governments uh, or city and county governments. Uh, so. The uh, this uh, third party uh, Overwatch entity, you know, where would it be? Would it be in the federal government? It would have to probably be someplace in the federal government. But then, uh, uh, DoD is uh, the largest federal agency. So, uh, you know, how do you how do you get them to open up and to listen to this entity? 
So that that's it's the issue of uh, true accountability. Uh, will they be truly accountable or will they kind of blow you off? Uh, so some of the challenges, but I, I think, I think what runs through my mind is that um, it seems like I think they're missing the point that uh, that they need to operate in a very more sustainable way uh, to realize truly and operate uh, with the belief that uh, they need to be sustainable because climate change is a, a security threat to the world. Uh, and and there are our champions to protect our security. Uh, so let, let them become examples of how they can truly embrace and face up to the realities that they have to operate in a way that's sustainable, that's sustainable for our planet to for our island, for our aina. So Hema, I, I don't know if a third party would work. Um, I think right now we have the opportunity with uh, President Biden, if he would truly listen and uh, to convey through the Department of Defense, at least for the next remaining years, uh, uh, that uh, try to change the DOD uh, from within. Uh, they are inspector generals, so, you know, they have that process. Uh, uh, they have audits, audit processes, but how much, how much, for it, how much of it will be, you know, truly uh, made transparent and public? Uh, and how will they be held accountable? And that's a that's a problem here. We we have changes in command so frequently. Where is the accountability ultimately? Um. So I know you touched on, or you answered a question on what are the after effects on the environment, um, with the gas, um, sorry, gas draining. But, um, my question is uh, what are the after effects to those that have been consuming and using the contaminated water? And if there's any like research that's been done to see like what are the kind of, yeah, like after effects of all these people that have been using the water without knowing that it was contaminated. Uh, Lillian, I, I don't know what the long-term health effects are. Uh, I know that the, uh, I think the CDC and the Department of Health and EPA are now conducting uh, some studies or taking a survey, at least that's open up to military and non-military uh, folks that have been exposed to this uh, contaminated water. Um, yeah, I, I, I just really don't know. I, I think some of the symptoms that they, I've heard some of the symptoms, you know, in the media that you know, people are throwing up, getting diarrhea, getting rashes, uh, headaches, um, those are terrible things, but uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. I think it will have to be followed very closely. Um, one thing that's kind of struck me uh, in being exposed to this issue for eight years now is there is no maximum contaminant levels for fuel components in our fuel in our drinking water. Um, uh, so the health department has to set something but I'm a little surprised because I don't think fuel contamination is unique only to Oahu. Uh, fuel is stored and moved all over the over over the country. So I'm, I think other communities have also experienced that. I, I know for one in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, had a leak of about over 20 million gallons of gasoline into their underground aquifer, and it's now contaminated one of their drinking water wells. Um, and they've been fighting that for 25 years, I think, uh, and have, don't have a resolution yet. So what surprises me is not, there's not regulated when I think field contamination is much more probably widespread than, uh, than we are aware of. I, I'm sorry, Lydia, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, Digressing, I, I hope I answered your question. And I just want to mahalo you again for coming out today. And I also want to mahalo all of our OPO panels. Um, 
uh, OPO panelists for their amazing questions. Um, you know, if this is the future, our future is looking good because these are the tough questions that we need to be asking um, and the questions that we need to um, be posing so that we can educate ourselves. And you know, Ernie, you, you this is not a new issue. This is an issue that has been uh, occupying our news feeds. This is an issue that's been on major news outlets uh, as of late. But like you said, you've been tackling this issue since 2014. And I just want to mahalo you uh, for your commitment to our Lahui, to our communities. Um, you know, it's, it's, I've been on, on the social media spaces. I don't know if you've noticed, but you've actually got some memes going on. I know some people has, have been putting memes together saying, listen to Uncle Ernie. Um, some people have been putting memes together. I saw a sticker that says, we love Ernie. Um, and stuff like that. So I think so that the new hashtag is going to be hashtag trust is earned. So mahalo nui again for, you, for your commitment uh, to our communities and, and all the work that you've been doing. And mahalo again to all of our OPO panelists from all of our different schools. Halau Kumana, Ka'ahalahui o Ole Kona, Waianai High School, as well as the University of Hawaii at Hilo. And I just wanted to remind everybody who's watching tonight, you know, the views that these haumana have shared are theirs and theirs alone. It doesn't necessarily reflect the views of their institutions, but we mahalo them for taking the opportunity to come and use their voice. And I also want to mahalo our co-moderator for tonight, Josh. Mahalo nui, Josh, for everything. Mahalo, everybody. And thank you for having me, <laughs> bearing with this old, uh, old person here. <laughs> so, Mahalo, and I, I trust you guys all to carry on and stay in the marathon here. Don't give up. Mahalo. Absolutely. Go ahead, Josh. Take it away. As we conclude this evening's event, we want to express a warm mahalo again to Mr. Ernie Lau from the Honolulu Board of Water Supply for taking the time to talk with us and engage with our OPO. Mahalo, Mr. Lau, for your leadership. A special mahalo to our OPO participants for your willingness to participate and make your voices heard. We're the next generation of leaders and we need to make sure that we provide opportunities for all of us to engage on the issues, leaving a lasting impact on our communities, our islands and the world. Youth provide meaningful insight into some of our biggest challenges as seen with this panel, and we want to encourage everyone to continue fighting for a better future together. Mahalo to our sponsors, Kanayokana and Kono, for putting this together. Follow them on social media as they will be announcing more events like this in the coming weeks. Mahalo nui to everyone tuning in as well, and good night.